All right, Cheers. next up, we've got a dynamic duo with Eric and Alex. Don't worry about time. We're going to be okay on time. If we have to rob a couple of minutes from the next flight, it's okay, because the next one's a fireside chat. You can jump right into your talk, and I'm going to be quiet. Have at it. Awesome. Yeah, hey, Bart. Hey, hello, everyone. And hey, Eric, I had no hope to be able to speak with you again. And here we go. So that's amazing. <laughs> yes, yes. We're old coworkers from, uh, we both worked at Datastacks during the, the same time period. So uh, gave, gave our fair share of talks together. <laughs> this is awesome. Yeah. So that's first time uh, for a long, uh, that's the first time for a long time and it feels great. So I see we have a lot of attendees today. And first of all, I want to see if you can hear us and see us, so please set the thumbs up in the YouTube chat and we will start. Cool. I'm curious about how big is the delay between Zoom and YouTube. Sometimes it can be to half a minute. Yep, I but, was looking at it earlier and it looked like it was about 30 seconds. So thumbs up, okay, there we go, all right, up. let's do it. Perfect. So we are short on time and we have so many great things to discuss today. So let's start actually right now. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's Eric Zitlow uh, right behind me on the YouTube screen. And uh, Alex Volochnev, uh, I am a developer advocate at Datastax. And Eric is the director of developer relations at Maya Data. And we work a lot with data, Kubernetes, and data again, because data repeats, uh, this deserves to be repeated twice. So what is it about? Uh, we today going to speak about data. It means what well data matters for applications. And of course, we have to mention infrastructure. But again, what really matters is the data. How much would cost uh, Facebook as an organization without all of its data? Well, I believe like very, they very- have a business. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they would run out of business, 100%. So let's proceed. First part of our talk today is Apache Cassandra. It's a NoSQL distributed database. I'm really curious how much of you, uh, how many of you know what is it about. So if you have heard about Cassandra or use it all time, again, write a message in the YouTube chat. So. But in short, if you have no experience, it's a NoSQL distributed database, which has some amazing features. Uh, it's already being used by the huge companies and it's, I believe the popularity will continue to grow. Why? Let's talk about the main features. Big data ready. For example, Apple uses Apache Cassandra to handle hundreds petabytes of data. Data, not uh, the pictures, not the videos, but uh, like text data. And then you talk about hundreds petabytes of data. It's something big. Uh, highest possible availability with multi-data center deployments and so on. The geographical distribution, that what you need to have to have disaster tolerant solutions. Highest possible read-write performance, zero downtime, especially on the operations, well, as long as you have configured it correctly. And it's an Apache Software Foundation project, so it's vendor independent. Um, what matters for us to understand the first? It's a distributed database. So you can run Cassandra with a single uh, node, but usually it makes no sense as long as it's not um, some development environment. You need to have more. And nodes together united into the data center. It's a decentralized database. It means what it has no master nodes or and, uh, slave node like we use it to talk or now we call primary, secondary, write replicas, read replicas, nothing like that. Every replica is able to answer to every question. Everyone's a full citizen. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, every node is a first class citizen and there is nothing like secondary replicas. Every replica matters. Then together, they united into the data center, also known a ring, and every node is able to communicate with every node. And, uh, oh, and that's what matters for me again. It's uh, by design from the very beginning, it's a native multi-DC system. So you can have multiple data centers working, working as a part of a single data center without any problems. So there are no 
complications on that. That's a native behavior to have multiple data centers within one single cluster. And you may ask now, okay, so some of them are maybe active and other specific. And again, nothing like that. As all a, active, active, yeah. which is actually one of the really cool things about Cassandra, because I, I could, in your, your slide here, I could write to the US data center and be reading from the EU data center. And the only thing I have to worry about is the time on the wire latency to get that across the ocean. Exactly. And uh, yeah, that, again, that works natively and doesn't require any special configuration. So first thing we have to understand about Cassandra as a big data ready, as I told you, when we have to distribute the data. So all the parts of the data you have, even a single table, are spread it into multiple partitions over your cluster. That's what helps us to be uh, scalable. Cassandra is elastically linearly scalable with zero overhead on adding new nodes. Netflix did an incredible research on Cassandra scalability. They scaled the cluster, test cluster of Cassandra from 30 to 300 nodes. And like it's an incredible picture with a very smooth line with no uh, jumps, with no downstairs, like nothing like that. It's a very a straight line and you can grow more and more just adding new nodes. So data is distributed, which helps to grow, which, have, which helps to be uh, big data ready. But is that enough? Not exactly. Second point is data is replicated. To have highest possible availability, availability you need to replicate your data. And with like a usual recommended replication factor free per data center, um, it means what every row, or better to say partition, is stored on three different nodes. It gives us an incredible ability. As long as one node goes down, that's not a big deal. First of all, we still have enough nodes to dispatch your data back and execute both write and read operation. And second of all, Cassandra is smart and Cassandra is doing your job a lot. So as soon as node recovers, it will be self-healed and all the other nodes will send to this missing node, recover it node. Okay, that's what you missed. That's the data, or what data mutations changed uh, when you was not available. And that's an incredible job to see how cluster is doing job of database reliability engineers, for example, just self-recovering. That's one of the features I really love because I'm very lazy and I'm happy to see how database is doing my job. And finally, uh, Cassandra uh, is a good fit for modern cloud uh, deployments because it really understands the topology of the system we are working with. If it's your own on-premise data center, there still will be data centers and server racks. If we speak about cloud deployments, there still will be uh, regions and availability zones. It doesn't matter if it's a server rack or availability zone, Cassandra will care to put replicas as far away from each other as it possible. Because uh, of a simple reason, racks or availability zones tend to fail together. And if you have all of your replicas within the same AZ or server rack, you may lose the whole uh, set of replicas. So if Cassandra for to consider that network topology and put the data replicas as far from each other as it possible, and again, it's done automatically without my participation. So again, makes me happy. And finally, I've mentioned that before, but again, I want to show it. It's geographic, geographically distributed deployment. It's really easy to do with Cassandra. So you may have your data on the United States, Europe, and Asia, and it will be a single cluster. And every server in this cluster is able to write data or read data um, dispatching the information you requested for. Also, it's platform agnostic. So you can go with uh, Microsoft Azure, AWS, your own deployment, Google Cloud, whatever you prefer, simultaneously. So part of your cluster may be on Microsoft Azure, part on AWS, part on Google Cloud. And if something goes down, you still have at least two data centers available. That may bring some costs from the data transfer point of view, but well, 100% of time never was cheap. Okay, so. Awesome. Yeah. 
So, yeah, um, real quick, uh, you all should know what Kubernetes is. You're all at KubeCon after all. <laughs> but um, simply put, um, Kubernetes is basically a, a tool for containerization and managing those containers. Uh, next slide here, Alex. All right, so storage orchestration is kind of one of the biggest pieces of actually running data on Kubernetes because uh, by default, pods in Kubernetes are ephemeral. Now, if you want to get deep into this, uh, you can view my talk from earlier today. Uh, we don't have enough time to kind of rehash through the whole thing, but we're going to just give a brief overview and then move into actually hopefully showing you here how this all works. So next slide. Okay, so simple uh, Kubernetes setup. You have your master, you have your workers. Each of them have a bunch of different parts. Uh, etcd is run on the master. It's basically the, the phone book for all your services, all your different components. Whenever anything needs to reference something, it goes to etcd, says, hey, where is this thing with this tag or, or this specific name service? And then etcd returns with the, the connection points, all of the things that that needs to hit what it's trying to hit. So that's important. Uh, next slide here. Okay, so traditionally, uh, your data would be stored in the outside world and you'd basically consume it inside Kubernetes. Uh, next slide, if you would. And, and so in the outside world, you'd have either database as a service, you'd have S3 buckets, you'd have uh, any kind of equivalent uh, storage solution, or maybe you co-locate your actual on-premise you know, database, your, your MySQL, NoSQL, whatever it was, you would put that near your Kubernetes cluster, but it wouldn't live inside your Kubernetes cluster. So basically, Kubernetes could manage everything up until the point where you actually had data. But we're in the data on Kubernetes community. So let's, let's take a look at a different thing. Next slide. So stateful sets basically keep, give pods persistent identities, more or less. That's kind of an oversimplification, but for purposes of our discussion, that's what you need to know is it basically gives a pod a persistent identity so you can actually do things to that pod without losing um, kind of the, the, the data on it. Now, it, it doesn't store data itself, but things like the path to the data storage are important to persist. Next slide. All right, so you have... Persistent volumes, now these could be anything from spinning disks you've managed to some sort of network attached drives to whatever. We don't really care at this point. It's just some form of storage. Then you have your persistent volume claim, your pods in Kubernetes attached to your persistent volume claims, or I should say they use your persistent volume claims to claim storage. Next slide. So if you try and set this all up yourself and you try and set up drives attached to specific worker nodes, it quickly kind of uh, spirals out of control and becomes very, very complex. Uh, next slide. What OpenEDS does is it basically sits in the middle layer there between your application, your stateful pods, your stateful sets, and it, it actually handles this orchestration of your storage for you. So it basically makes EBS uh, volumes, so elastic uh, block storage, volumes out of whatever your underlying uh, storage layer is and makes them consumable and discoverable by your actual Kubernetes stateful pods. So really, really cool. All right, next slide. So what we end up with here is an open EBS control plane and NDM is basically the process. It has an operator. And, that, and a daemon set that basically goes ahead and discovers all of your block devices based on filterable conditions. So it automatically discovers what disks there are out there that are available. Um, and then your local PV provisioner goes to the pool that, that the NDM made and it will pull disks and provision this, you know, the specific disks as, as resources in Kubernetes. And then the uh, normal uh, persistent volume claim is just used to then grab those drives, connect them to pods, and everything in our pods is wrapped in this nice stateful set so that they persist between uh, you know, past events. So we can basically make a database and have a unique pod within Kubernetes that is always going to control, in the case of Cassandra, it's always going to have that token range, that replication, that data is always going to be connected to that pod, and we can always bring it back that way. So really, really powerful. All right, next slide. And awesome. back to AU, Alex. Yep. So then Kate Sanram. 
As you could guess from the name, Cassandra is something between Cassandra and Kubernetes. And that's indeed an amazing thing. So it's all started with CAS operator, Kubernetes Cassandra operator for Cassandra to automate uh, deployment, some rolling updates, and so on and so forth. But at some point, we realize that what that is not enough. So running a database, you need actually more tools to control that. Do you need monitoring? Yes, you do. Do you need backups? Yes, you do. And so many other things. And at some point, we got into the state what CAS iterator is just not enough. We need something better. That the moment then Kate Sandra was born. Kate Sandra is a scalable, not database, but data platform with administration tools and easy data access, completely open source, based on Apache Cassandra. And what is it and how it comes into the game? Very easy. So uh, using uh, Kubernetes as the foundation, it deploys Cassandra and all the required management tools and all the extensions, well, depending on what do you enable in the configuration, of course, because batteries are included, but swappable, you get just more than the simple database. I wouldn't call Cassandra a simple database, but let's say you get something more. You get a data platform delivering much more than you could expect. So first thing we start to talk about of Kate Sandra, Kate's first Kate Sandra component or base is a Cassandra scalable cloud native database managed via CAS operator. Then second component is extremely important is a Stargate. And Stargate is a really cool thing. It works as a node in a Cassandra cluster, but it opens something more than uh, just CQL, Cassandra query language. It allows you to work with Cassandra using not Cassandra specific protocols like CQL, but REST API, GraphQL, and document API like Mongo similar. And that's incredible because you know what? Developers always want to have multiple databases, especially for microservices. We want to have uh, this one. We want to have document API. We want to have, uh, I don't know, Redis. We want to have uh, some SQL database and so on and so forth. Delivering Cassandra with Scargate, I can have multiple APIs and still maintain only one database, still do backups for one database, still monitor one database, uh, meanwhile, giving developers much more tools they usually ask for. Um, then one of the essential Kate Sandra components is, of course, uh, traffic Kubernetes ingress. You may know it. Um, that's, again, batteries included but swappable. You are good to go with your own ingress. Uh, by, by default, we use traffic. Then Reaper and Medusa, two very important tools. Reaper helps you to run repairs. So when you use a distributed, decentralized system, one issue comes into the game is a consistency problem. You need to keep consistency. And Cassandra has a multiple layers of defense uh, from inconsistency, but uh, we need on a regular basis to have to run repairs. So Reaper is a very convenient tool to maintain and run repairs. And Medusa is a tool for to organize backups. Of course, backups are very important. Of course, with Cassandra, you may not lose all of your data uh, just uh, because one of your data centers was wiped. Data is replicated to another data centers or to another availability zones. But still, uh, there is a ch chance of a human mistake, some data deleted because of some mistake, and so on. So you need to be able to run backups and recover them. That's the Medusa does uh, its job very well. And finally, of course, monitoring. Uh, metrics collector for Apache Cassandra, Prometheus, and Grafana together doing great job. And it's all um, already integrated into the Kate Sandra. So you don't have to run your own dashboards and so on and so forth. It's prepared and you just run and go use that. And finally, it's packaged and delivered via Helm charts. I hope you know what's the Helm already. If you don't, we can call it like a package manager for uh, Kubernetes-based systems. It's a really convenient one. And well, actually, I really enjoy using Helm-based deployments. And the last few words about that, how it works all together. 
So uh, the core of uh, Kate Sandra is, of course, still Cassandra, but we have some more components. As external queries comes into the cluster, they are routed by ingress or to Stargate, this REST GraphQL document APIs uh, to work directly with for your external apps or being routed to internal systems, they then can go to uh, Stargate still or directly to Cassandra if your service uses uh, CQL, Cassandra query language. And when we have three important blocks working with Cassandra for operations people, so we have a monitoring block for operators, we have Reaper for uh, consistency, and we have Medusa as a backup and restore tool working usually with Amazon S3, but it may also work with uh, Minio, for example, or the, so there are some more choices. And of course, deployment uh, done by Helm, as I've mentioned before. And well, talk is cheap, show me the code. And uh, Eric is going to show you the code and how it runs. Yeah, let me just check. Uh, Bart, do we have time for, I think I can do it in about four minutes. Is that cool? Do it, do it, do it, do it. All right, Make cool. history, do it. I am going to go ahead and grab the screen here then. And yep, Alex I guess, sharing. wait a second. I'm stopping sharing right now. Just looking for the button. Oh, okay, stop share. It's here. Boom. Okay, perfect. You're and I'm going to blow through this real quick. Um, so hopefully everyone can kind of see it. So right here, um, basically what I have is this is just uh, a in-browser web IDE. Um, exactly what you'd expect if you were running like VS Code, but in a web browser, it's actually uh, Eclipse there. So, all right. So what we see here is I'm actually, uh, I have a Kubernetes cluster already. I've got three nodes, one master, two workers. What I'm going to do is I am going to start uh, basically installing these different components. So the first component I need to install is Open EBS. And I'm, I'm going to be copy pasting all of these things because we're just too tight on time. Um, so there we go. Uh, I can see Open EBS is installed. The uh, namespace has created and we got container creating on all those. I'm not going to wait for that to actually uh, finish here because we are... Uh, Again, tight on time. So let's go ahead and get our block devices. These are all the block devices that are on the, uh, that are attached to the cluster. So that's again, using NDM is finding these and basically putting them in this pool. So when I run the block device command, it returns them as valid. Okay, next I'm going to actually tag those. So for this particular deployment. So essentially, I could have multiple things running in Kubernetes and maintain different pools of disks. All right, so we got that one labeled. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to grab a couple of these. I'm not going to grab all of them just for the sake of time here. Okay, and let's go ahead and take that. Okay, I got two. That's enough. We're actually only going to spin up one node of Kate Sandra, so that this is this is absolutely fine. All right, next we're going to go ahead and deploy a, a local device YAML. Um, I can actually show you that uh, where right here the name is local device. That's key. Um, and then basically the provisioner is open EBS local. Um, in our Kate Sandra YAML, we'll apply later, you'll notice that the storage class is local device. So the storage class I just created is what I'm referencing, which again is, is tied into open EBS. All right, let's go ahead and we're gonna install Helm, which is just gonna be a quick curl and uh, run a setup script, which we have like, there. How come you don't have Helm installed? Uh, yeah, so for this demonstration, generally I, I show a home install because it's not something everyone always has like everyone has has kubernetes here not everyone has home so i i tend to show that but yeah i i know what you mean <laughs> all right now we're going to add the kate sandra repo uh so this is basically using helm to uh kind of it's actually very similar to adding something to like apt or or yum um and then we're going to go ahead and do some traffic install here. Huge shout out to Traffic. They're actually a really awesome company based out of France. They do a lot of work with open source. Um, just really, really cool company. All right, home install. And now we're doing that Kate Sandra YAML that I showed you that's referencing our particular storage class there. And we're gonna go ahead here. And this is the longest command to complete. Yeah, it takes some time. 
Yep, just hopefully a minute, minute and a half, no more than that, hopefully. And then we'll be able to, I've never run through it this fast before, so we'll see if we run into any errors from moving too quickly. But, okay. And uh, I'm just going to demonstrate once this is up that this is in fact working. So let's do a get data centers. We actually see the data center name. We can have multiple, we can have many, that's, that's totally fine. Okay, um, now I'm going to do something really quick to get a, the username and password that are stored uh, for Cassandra. So that's the uh, username right there. And then the password, I, I will point out that the username is always going to be by default Cassandra super user, but um, that's, or, sorry, Kate Sandra super user. That's uh, just, it is what it is at this point. So I'm gonna go ahead here and I am going to use those to connect into CQLSH. So, oops, uh, that didn't work. Uh, bin bash, there we go. CQL. Got too many things running here at once. There we go. Oops, uh, one train for the container. Yes, I must. Okay, that's my fault. CQLSH, and that's because I had it copied on two lines in my notes here, and I needed it only on one, but that's fine. Um, there's that, dash P for password, and that's my decoded password that I pulled out of everything there. All right, uh, do, do, do error flag U, CQLSH U, did I do that wrong? You see a, do you see the error there? Uh, Oh, ha, yes, simple error, simple error indeed. Um, we're gonna go bin bash. and I need an and right there. There we go, all right, stopped. I can do these on two separate lines. Uh, you maybe want to add uh, two dashes uh, in front of the command. Uh, two dashes. Yeah. And that's definitely not vin bash. You are correct. This is what I get for typing too quickly. <laughs> in bash, that looks right. Yeah, that looks better to me. Oops, and I put a space there. Nope, 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 nope. Okay, hang on. Let me let me go back to the drawing board here. We're gonna copy straight from my notes. Mesh default stc one. Oh, continues in the pod. Okay, let's let's just describe real quick. Um, and I'll just grab whichever one is there. No, I don't want to describe. I went to get. Oops. I can't get this going. We're gonna have to move on just so I don't, oh, there it is. There's the actual identifier for the pod. Which uh, is... You cannot connect to it, it's not ready. Oh, I'm trying to do it too early, okay. Yeah, I mean, it looks like we cannot connect right now because if we have uh, zero out of two um, containers in the pod, it means something went wrong and we will not be able to use this stateful set because at least uh, management container should be able to run. Yep, yep, so we're not gonna spin up quite fast enough here. Okay. So, you know what? It's uh, not so important. We are uh, out of time already, so what I would suggest, if you maybe- I could show that it's leased, actually. Yep. Uh, let's, let's do that. So what I'm gonna do is, it hopefully is in fact leased. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to reshow block devices. Oh, no, it's still not. Okay, we're not at that point yet either. So we're going to have to move on. Sorry for the sake of time, but essentially good. we ran all the commands. We actually have Kate Sanders spinning up. Um, what it would show here is, is one of these would actually show claimed, and we would actually be able to trace through the described uh, commands of all the different levels. So we could actually describe our PVC, we could describe our PV, we can describe our pod, and we can actually trace that through all the volumes and figure out what was connected where, or for all, through all the, um, sorry, elements, and figure out what was connected where. Um, and then um, there's some simple, um, uh, just 
you know, uh, CQL code. I will post in the uh, YouTube chat if anyone wants to run exactly what I just did. Um, there's a README here, which is from a workshop I've done. You just follow that to the letter. All you need is, you know, a couple nodes of, of Kubernetes and that'll get you started. You can go in there, run everything in and, and uh, go from there. So, yeah. Yep. And I think, if, I think, yeah, yeah sorry, sorry last, last phrase. So, if you are interested in Cassandra and Kate Sandra, Tomorrow, we do a free hours workshop on completely different topic. So you can jump in and see what is it and how it works. Like into some deeps, you cannot become a professional in free hours, but we definitely can show you some most important points to consider. And it's uh, free, available as a part of a Kubernetes and sponsored by data stacks, but based on 100% open source tools. So, right. yeah. I think I think what this really I think what this really comes down to is that we're gonna have to have both of you on a meetup so we can do part two. That's why. Yeah, I'm looking absolutely. At this. Maybe, maybe this is, we can do a longer form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, well. a, yeah. it's a it's a perfect works. excuse. It's a perfect excuse to have you guys back on. So anyway, thank you both very very much. Absolute pleasure. Let's keep going. Our next speaker. Very very excited about this. This is like our afternoon coffee um, that we are gonna be.